Hi, I'm John Stevenson, and I'm going to be taking you on a trip through Genesis chapter 6 through 11. First, what I'd like to do is look back at Genesis chapters 1 through 5 that we covered in our last session and compare it to the section that we're going to see now in Genesis chapters 6 through 11. In chapters 1 through 5, we had creation history with, with God creating the heavens and the earth. Then we saw the fall followed by the sons of Adam, specifically Cain and Abel, and we saw how Cain killed Abel and, and Abel was, was banished from the garden. We no, didn't note, but if we read a little further, we might have noticed that there was described a certain technological development of mankind as the sons of Lamech are said to have been the father of those who dwell in tents, and the father of those who use mu musical instruments, and the father of those who give rise to iron and metal, various sorts of metalworking. So that technological development is described in brief in those verses. Next, we find in chapters 5, uh, 10 generations mentioned following the line of Seth, and they go from Adam all the way to Noah. Now, as we come to Genesis chapters 6 through 11, we're going to see not the creation history, but the history of Noah and his family. We will look at the sons of Noah, and they will be set forth in Genesis chapters 9, 18 through uh, 29, and we'll see uh, his three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and their descendants. We will see not a technological de development, not to say that it's not there, but the focus instead will be an ethnic development of mankind as mankind uh, moves out and separates into all of the present nations. And there will be 70 nations that are mentioned in Genesis chapter 10. When we count the generations that are given in Genesis chapter 11, this is following the, the Tower of Babel uh, narrative, we're going to see again 10 generations, this time going from Noah to Terah. Notice we had 10 generations from Adam to Noah, who is followed by three sons. Again, we're going to see 10 generations from Noah to Terah, who likewise will be followed by three sons. Now, in Genesis chapter 6, verses 1 through 2, we read that it came about when men began to multiply on the face of the land, and daughters were born to them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men were beautiful, and they took wives for themselves, whomever they chose. One of the questions that immediately comes to mind in trying to interpret this passage is that phrase, the sons of God, and we're going to ask the question, what does that mean? But first we need to, to go a few verses more and read the context. In verse 3, we say, the Lord coming and saying, my spirit shall not strive with man forever, because he also is flesh. Nevertheless, his days shall be 120 years. Now, that does not mean that man's lifespan is going to, to suddenly be 120 years. Indeed, uh, we're going to see Noah and his sons even uh, have very, very long lifespans that will exceed that period of time. Instead, that seems to be a prophecy that within 120 years, mankind is going to cease off the earth, the exception being Noah and his family. In other words, this is a promise uh, this, this is the determination of the judgment of the flood. In verse 4, we have a new group identified. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days. The translators weren't quite sure what to do with that, and so they transliterated the, the word. The word Nephilim is actually a Hebrew word, um, and it can literally, it means the fallen ones, although sometimes it's been translated the giants. Uh, so the Nephilim, whoever they were, they were on the earth in those days. And also afterward, when the sons of God, there they are mentioned again, not being the same thing as the Nephilim, a, a different group. When the sons of God came into the daughters of men, and they bore children to them, and those, th that is probably those children, were the mighty men who were of old, men of renown. Of course, uh, you have an interpretive question. Uh, to whom do the those refer to? Does it ref refer to the to the children. By the way, notice the word children is italicized. I think the idea is there, uh, but it's, it's not actually in the Hebrew text. Do the those refer to the offspring, those born, or do the those refer to the Nephilim, the fallen ones, uh, who were the mighty men, who were of old, men of renown? There have been two, maybe three, popular interpretations of this passage. 
The first is that the sons of God, back, refer, back mentioned in verse 2 and again in verse 4, that they refer to angels. This was the interpretation held by Josephus, that first century historian who was a witness to the fall of Jerusalem, and he is relating not just his personal view, but a view that was very commonly held among the Jews of his day. And Josephus held to this interpretation uh, that the sons of God mentioned here uh, are a reference to angels. Um, it's true that that phrase, sons of God, seems to refer to angels when we see in the phrase used in the book of Job, both in Job chapters 1 and 2, and, and there we uh, have described a time when the sons of God came into the, in the you know, they seem to be in heaven, they, came, they come before God, and, and God's interacting with them, and, and Satan shows up, and then later on again in, in Job chapter 38 and verse 4, when God is create, describing the creation, when he brought creation into being, and he says, and all of the sons of God shouted for joy. In those situations, that phrase, sons of God, seemed to be a reference to angels. On the other hand, angels in heaven don't marry, but these, these angels, they're, well, they're not in heaven. So it, it might be that, the, that this is uh, something where the sons of God come and, and uh, sort of mix it up, intermarry with the daughters of men. That, that's the theory that is being presented here. The resulting offspring, according to the theory at least, produce giants, although it's not entirely clear from the text that that's uh, where the giants, that, that's where they come from. This view is also supported in the apocryphal book of Enoch, and it seems to be um, supported in Jude, I want to say chapter 6, it's actually verse 6 because there's only one chapter in the book of Jude. And so there, there is some support for this. Uh, I'm not sure that I take the apocryphal book of Enoch as being authoritative, but it is quoted, that book is quoted, not with reference to this being angels, but it is quoted in the book of Jude. Now another view, and I think a perhaps more contextual view, might be that the sons of God refer to the descendants of Seth. You see, the preceding chapters, Genesis chapter 4 and chapter 5, set forth a contrast of two lines, two seed, um, where we saw the descendants of Cain, and then the, uh, in chapter 5 we saw the descendants of Seth. And that seems to be the context of Genesis. And so if I'm following the context and letting that drive my interpretation, then I might come to the conclusion that this is the descendants of, of Cain and versus the descendants of Seth. And those seeds are mixing and perhaps they're spiritually mixing as well. Um, this is emphasized at the end of Genesis chapter 4, where we read that men began to call upon the name of the Lord. And if they began to call upon the name of the Lord, maybe they began to be known as sons of God. Notice also that it's mankind that is punished in the flood. There's no, no reference to punishing the... Uh, angels, angels don't don't even come into the picture with regard to the flood, and this idea of sonship, calling them sons of God, is really a common theme in the Old Testament, where where God describes Israel and his spiritual seed as his people, uh, his offspring, uh, and so so that fits as well. Also, we could note that marriage of a godly seed to ungodly people is a common theme throughout the book of Genesis. Uh, we're going to see uh, Ishmael taking a bride, you know, actually a series of brides, who will not be from God's people. And again, e um, Esau will do something along those lines. And we'll see that as a growing problem in the later chapters of Genesis. A third view, and this is perhaps a newer view that doesn't necessarily make it wrong, and that's that the sons of God refer to kings and rulers. Uh, the Aramaic translation of this, um, and also just the, the Aramaic figures of speech, and remember that Hebrew and Aramaic are closely related, tend to lend themselves to this interpretation. Uh, it's also true that the term Elohim refers to, that's the word that's translated God, uh, Elohim refers to human judges in Exodus chapters 21, verse 6, and also in Exodus 22, verses 8 and 9, as, as well as in Psalm 82, verses 1 and 6. 
And so usually when we read Elohim, we're, we're thinking God, or remember that word is plural, so given the context, it could refer to multiple false gods. But it also, on these few occasions, can refer to human judges, human rulers. There are some similar uses of that same phrase in Babylonian texts. Our problem is that this isn't in, in Babylonian, but it might help us to understand the figure of speech that's being presented here. Kings were often referred to as Elohim in the East. So again, that's taking the cultural context in which Moses writes and applying it to, uh, to these pages of the scriptures. There are also some parallels uh, in the actions of Lamech, who, who stands up and acts in sort of a kingly, rulerly, not very nice way. In other words, he's exercising sovereignty by killing a man and then challenging anybody to usurp his authority. The Nephilim, as I mentioned before, the, the word itself literally means the fallen ones doesn't necessarily refer to giants, although it can refer to that. Um, it refers to the fallen ones, and this view would, would see these as spiritually fallen. Now, whatever view that you take, uh, we have next the Lord coming to Noah, and he says to Noah, make for yourself an ark, the Hebrew word there, teba, excuse me, Hebrew, of gopher wood, um, it's interesting that this is the same word which is used for the ark into which the baby Moses was placed. Uh, literally, it means a, a, a chest, a box. Uh, and, and it might be a really big box, like, like the ark of Noah, or it might be a little tiny box into which this baby uh, Moses is going to be placed in his day. But the instructions, make for yourself an ark of gopher wood. That word gopher uh, is another one that puzzled the translators. And they weren't sure how to translate it, so they just put the Hebrew word gopher, they put it in English letters, and they, they left it at that. Uh, but make for yourselves an ark of gopher wood, and you shall make the ark with rooms, and shall cover it inside and out with pit. And this is how you shall make it. The length of the ark, 300 cubits. Now, we don't normally think in terms of cubits, but a cubit was roughly the, the length from your fingertip to your elbow. For us, that's around 18 inches. I suppose if you were a little shorter, your cubit might be a touch smaller. Uh, they even had a royal cubit because that was the cubit of the king. And as you can imagine, it was just a little bit bigger, but, but roughly the 18 inches is still going to, to um, serve us well. And its breadth 50 cubits and its height 30 cubits. So what we have described is this long, rather flat, if I can call it a barge, uh, I did, did a lot of work in my, in my younger years in a seaport, and I saw that shape in, in propane and, and petroleum barges that would come into the seaport, uh, and it's a familiar shape. It's, it's very seaworthy and works quite well. Now, chapters 6 through 9 give us, again, this parallel sort of outline. You notice it looks sort of funny with a uh, middle point in the middle. This sort of outline is known as a chiasm. Uh, it begins with Noah's three sons. It's going to end in chapter 9, verse 18, with Noah's three sons. And we mo move from a mention of his sons down to the covenant that God promised to make with Noah. And in that covenant, the covenant always contains uh, promises. That's not the only thing a covenant uh, comprises. We'll talk about more about that a bit later. But God promised to make a covenant with Noah, and in that covenant, he promises to destroy the earth with a flood. Notice down in chapter 9, verses 18 through 17, uh, God seals that covenant after the, after the flood, and he also gives a promise with that new, co that new covenant, that post-flood covenant, uh, and he promises not to destroy the earth with a flood. So first there's a promise to destroy the earth. At the end of the story in chapter 9, verses 8 through 17, there's going to be a promise not to destroy the earth with a flood. Then there's the command in verse 21 to take food. Uh, notice how that correlates and parallels when we get to chapter 9, verse 14. There's going to be a command what not to eat. They're not, not going to be able to eat blood. And that's going to be uh, a continuing command. And then in chapter 7, verse 1, Noah and his family enter the ark. We actually have the flood uh, coming from uh, chapter 7, verse 11, where it says, In the 600th day of Noah's life, you know, the, the, the waters come. 
all the way to the end, uh, or at least close to the end of chapter 8, chapter 8, verse 13. And then Noah and his family will come out of the ark. So we have this, this chiastic pattern with the flood being the center point. That's the focus of this entire section, how the flood comes. Now in that center point, notice the, the Lord shuts the door and it rains for 40 days and 40 nights. And we're told in verses 18 through 20, the waters increase until the mountains are covered. And for 150 days, the waters prevail. And then in chapter 8, verse 1, and this is, I think, the center point of the entire section, God remembers Noah. And after that, after God remembering Noah, the waters begin to abate. And notice the pattern, just as the waters prevailed for 150 days, now they abate, they, they decrease, they dry up for 150 days. And just as the waters were increased until the mountains were covered, so now the waters decrease until the mountains become visible in chapter 8, verses 4 and 5. And just as the Lord shut the door and it rained for 40 days and 40 nights, at the end of 40 days, God, you know, remember Noah, Noah opens the window and he allows those birds to go out and finally they're able to come out of the ark. So, so that entire section is chiastic with the central point being that there comes a time when God remembers Noah. Looking back again at our, at our big outline, we have Noah's family coming out of the ark. I'm skipping down to chapter 8, verse 14. Uh, the command not to eat blood. And then God enters into a covenant with Noah. This is the covenant that he promised to make when he was promising to destroy the earth with a flood. But now his promise is that the earth would not again be destroyed with a flood. Now, it's not saying it will never again be destroyed but it would not be destroyed with the flood. And the sign of that covenant is going to be the rainbow. In chapter 8, verse 4, in the seventh month, on the 17th day of the month, the ark rested upon the mountains of Ararat. We already noted that Ararat is that area from which the Tigris and Euphrates River uh, find their, their origins. They flow down from the land, not from the, it doesn't say the mountain of Ararat, it says the mountains plural in the land of Ararat. And in the ancient world, this was known as either Ararat, or if you wanted to be Assyrian, you would call it Urartu, but it's, it's the same name. And this is the place where the Ark lands. We're, we're now on, on pretty good geographical footing. Noah comes out of the ark, and God spoke to Noah and to his sons with him, saying, Now, behold, I myself do establish my covenant with you and with your descendants after you and with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the cattle, and every beast of the earth with you, and all that comes out of the ark, even every beast of the earth. So the, the covenant, this covenant is going to ma be made not just with Noah, not just with Noah and his family, but with the entire world, with Noah, with mankind, with animals, with everything that is upon the earth. Now, we come to the question, what is a covenant? A covenant involves several things. First of all, it involves promises. There are promises in a covenant. Secondly, uh, a covenant involves a relationship. Sometimes we speak of a marriage covenant, and that's an appropriate thing. But a covenant is always a bond in blood. You see, you don't make a covenant. You always cut a covenant. They don't always translate it that way in, in, the, in our English translations. But they ought to. I guess they don't because it would be confusing to the normal reader. But to make a covenant, to, or as to say it correctly, to cut a covenant, you would take an animal and you would actually kill the animal and you would cut the animal in two. And then the parties entering into the covenant would pass between the pieces, pieces of the animal. And what you were saying is that if I do not keep the terms and conditions and promises of the covenant, then may what, that, what happened to that animal also happen to me. And so God enters into a covenant with Noah, with his descendants, and with every living creature. God says, if I don't keep my promise, then may what happened to, to a sacrificial animal happen to me. May I be destroyed. May I cease to exist. Those are strong words. And so God says, I establish my covenant with you. 
and all flesh shall never again be cut off by the water of the flood. Neither shall there again be a flood to destroy the earth. Now, Noah, after this, begun, begins farming, and he plants a vineyard, and he drank of the wine and became drunk. Uh, the, the passage isn't saying that's an appropriate thing to do. It's just telling the story. Notice how, how we're told what happened in people's lives, sort of warts and all, even, even their downfalls. But he drank of the wine and became drunk. This is not a, a, a permission for us to go and do likewise. But he drank of the wine and became drunk and uncovered himself inside his tent. And Ham, the father of Canaan, and at this point in the narrative, you're supposed to sort of pick up your ears because Canaan is historically significant to the life of Israel. And here, this is an origin story. And so Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brothers outside what he is doing is acting in a very shameful way, shaming his father. And Shem and Japheth, the other two sons of Noah, act in a very different way. They act in an honorable way. They take a garment and they lay it bo upon both their shoulders and they walk backward and they cover the nakedness of their father and their faces were turned away so that they did not see their father's nakedness. So they're, they're acting in an appropriate way toward their father Noah. But when Noah awoke from his wine, he knew what his youngest son, that is Ham, had done to him. And so he says this in four, and notice it's given in almost sort of a rhythm, sort of poetry, but it is given in terms of a prophecy. So he said, cursed be, not Ham, but cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants. We, we can translate a slave of slaves. He shall be to his brother. A curse is put on Canaan, and that's going to be historically significant to the Israelites as they are getting ready to go into the land of Canaan. It explains the judgment that they will bring upon that land that will be a carrying out of this promise. Noah also says, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem, and let Canaan be his servant. That's a reference back to the previous verse. May God enlarge Japheth and let him dwell in the tents of Shem and let Canaan be his servant. Now, notice the play on words. God says, may God enlarge the term Yafet. May he enlarge Japheth. May he enlarge Yafet. You say, wait a minute, you said that word twice. Because the words are nearly identical. You just change, change the vowel a little bit. So really what, what, what we read is, may God, may God japheth japheth, or may God enlarge the enlarged guy. Uh, that's what the word japheth means. So may God enlarge japheth, let him dwell in the tents of Shem. And of course our question, and it's, this is usually Passover, this isn't usually even considered, let him well, in the tents of Shem. But I want to ask, to whom does the pronoun refer? In the past, I used to read this and think, well, God is enlarging Japheth, so the, the hymn refers to Japheth. Let him, Japheth, dwells in the tents of Shem. And, and that seems to be the majority view, but, but most scholars ask, in what way did Japheth dwell in the tents of Shem? And there's no really good answer to that. And perhaps because that the reason for that is because a wrong presupposition has been adopted that the hymn does not refer to Japheth, but refers to the other person mentioned in verse 27, that it refers to God. May God enlarge Japheth and let him, that is him, God, dwell in the tents of Shem. And if that is correct, then it has a special import to Moses and to the Israelites to whom this passage is. Because if the hymn refers to God, they are living in a day when God was dwelling in the tents of Shem, that is, in the tabernacle. Remember how the book of Exodus is going to end, where God comes and enters the tabernacle and his presence is with them. And so I think that this passage looks forward to the Exodus event, both leaving Egypt and that time when in the wilderness God comes and dwells with his people. Now we noted before 
that seed of the serpent and seed of the woman, and we saw how the spiritually speaking, Cain seems to have followed that that seed of the serpent, and that genealogy is traced in Genesis chapter four all the way down to Lamech. And now we move over to Abel. Uh, well, Abel's d died, so it's not really Abel anymore. It's Seth now, who gives rise to Enoch, who walks with God, and that follows down to Noah, uh, through through whom God saves the world uh, in the ark. He he delivers Noah, and the promise has now continued to Shem, bypassing Ham, Ham who it wasn't Ham who was cursed. It was Ham's son Canaan who was cursed. But now that promise goes through Noah, through Shem, through a number of generations, and it will come eventually to Abraham. Now, before we get to Abraham, we have to look at Genesis chapter 11, where we have the Tower of Babel narrative. And in chapter 11, verse 1, we read that the whole earth used the same language and the same words. It came about as they journeyed east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and settled there is just another word for what we call Mesopotamia, that land between the, two, the Euphrates and the Tigris rivers. And here they are going to form a city. They're going to plant a city. This name will be known as Babel or Babel. Back up there. Let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they used brick for stone and they used tar for mortar. And they said, come, let us build for ourselves a city and a tower whose top will reach into heaven. And let us make for ourselves a name. There's a play on words there because the word name, uh, the way you say that in Hebrew is Shem. It just sounds like uh, the, same, the same word that you have the, for the name of one of Noah's sons, who's Shem. God had made promises to Shem, and, and now these folks come and say, we're going to make a Shem for ourselves, uh, for ourselves a name. Otherwise, we'll be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. And so they come to build a tower. A bit about temple towers, especially those that were in Mesopotamia. We refer to them as ziggurats, and they have been found all throughout, up and down Mesopotamia, where these became very commonplace. This seems to be describing the first of those ziggurats, those temple towers, towers built to the In fact, uh, uh, a fellow uh, sent me an email a few years back when the Americans were in Iraq, and it was of this reconstructed temple tower, this ziggurat. Uh, uh, notice there was a, a plane flying nearby. I find, found that sort of fascinating uh, to compare. And at the, at the end of that time, God comes in and he confuses the language to disperse the plan. And therefore, because the, that becomes the point of, of confusion, the point of dispersal, therefore its name is called Babel, because there the, word con, the Lord confused the language of the whole earth. And from there, the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of the whole earth. Now, when we look at this word Babel, we don't see it again in the English text throughout the rest of the Bible, but we do see it continually in the Hebrew text. That is, through, throughout the rest of the Old Testament, any time we see, or in our English translation, the name Babylon, the Hebrew will be identical to what we find here in Genesis chapter 11, verse 9. It will be Babel. So Babel versus Babylon, they are the same place for some reason. I can't quite fathom why the translators chose to render it Babel here and Babylon everywhere else. But in the Hebrew text, it's exactly the same. So Babel versus uh, uh, Balel is, is actually the term to confuse. A uh, little play on words there, it sounds like. So that Genesis chapter 5, remember we had a genealogy there that started with Adam and it went 10 generations down to Noah and he had three sons. And that same pattern is now seen in Genesis chapter 11 after the Tower of Babel narrative where we have Noah now and following him are listed 10 generations that come all the way down to Terah who also has three sons. Now, that leads me to suspect that this is a stylized genealogy, similar to what I have in Matthew chapter 1, where I have uh, a pattern set forth where there's, there's 14 names and then 14 more names and 14 more names. And to get that perfect pattern of 14, 14, and 14, you actually have to leave out 
a couple of names and it's not that it's wrong it's just it's just giving a stylized genealogy it's only mentioning some of the descendants not all of them uh, and it, so it's it's given to to give that that particular pattern for a particular purpose in the case of uh, Matthew chapter 1 it's doing it so uh, it can have that number 14 14 14 which is a number that corresponds if you take the the letters of uh, the name of King David uh, Dawid, it's only three letters in Hebrew, uh, the, the D, the, what we call the V, uh, or the well, and then another D. And you add that up because that, those had numerical equivalents. They didn't have our, our Arabic way of, of writing our numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. What they would do is they would use letters for numbers. Uh, it adds up to 14. So it's a, a little clever way of, of putting the name David, sort of underscoring the name David, as sort of what we would do. Sometimes you see preachers using an acrostic, where where, where they'll have every point of the sermon start with the same letter, um, uh, or maybe the same word or phrase. The same thing's taking place here in in Genesis chapter five and chapter eleven, where I have ten generations followed by ten generations. That ten idea. Remember, we have ten commandments and ten plagues. Uh, ten is a big number uh, in the Pentateuch. And so I have 10 generations followed by 10 generations, which leads me to suspect that we are not meant to take all of the begats and add up all those years and try to determine when did the, exactly what year did the flood take place, exactly what year did the creation take place. Uh, I think we, we go wrong when we do that. So these are stylized uh, generations. That doesn't mean they're, they're not accurate, but the reason they are given is not for us to add up all the dates and, and try to figure out exactly when those events took place.